Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. As you can see, Professor Claudia Roda and I are here in the lovely building uh, to welcome David Wright to AUP. Uh, we've worked with David Wright for many years on uh, computer techno and technology projects having to do with human rights. David is the director of Trilateral Research, a company that he founded in 2004. Trilateral promotes ethical AI, and we believe that this fits squarely in with the themes of President Celeste Skink's uh, presidential lecture series on technology in the human future. Uh, David's innovative company provides research, data protection, and platform services to a wide range of clients, from law enforcement authorities to universities, museums, hospitals, and government agencies. Trilateral has offices in London and in Ireland with more than 120 employees, including some of our alumni. The majority of these employees have postdoctoral experience. Trilateral has partnered in more than 70 EU-funded projects, including several with AUP professors Perry and Rhoda. David has published more than 70 articles in peer-reviewed journals and has co-edited and co-authored several books, including Privacy Impact Assessment and another called Surveillance in Europe. David coined the term and published the first article on ethical impact assessment, the ISO standard on privacy impact assessment, which we've hosted, in fact, their annual meetings here at AEP, is based on his PIA methodology. David has participated in several foresight expert groups and has developed several scenario construction methodologies. He currently coordinates the EU-funded CC Driver Project on the human and technical drivers of cyber crime. Today, David will speak to us about his work on the ethics of technological self-defense, a subject of particular interest to our students, especially those who have just completed the 2022 French War College practicum. David's work is of seminal importance to AUP and to the larger community, and I hope you will join me in welcoming David Wright to AUP. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Susan, and um, thanks to you and, and uh, Claudia for um, inviting me to um, this uh, presidential lecture series. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and the topic, as you mentioned, uh, that I'd like to talk about is the ethics of AI-powered technological self-defense. So um, the stuff that I'd like to address today are the following on this um, brief agenda, the costs of cybercrime, ai powered cybercrime, uh, LEAs, law enforcement authorities, can't deal with all of the attacks that are occurring today. Uh, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, some disparities in cyber legislation. Um, and then I pose the question, should companies defend themselves? And what are the ethics of active defense? And then at the end, I draw some conclusions. So I won't uh, say anything more than um, Susan has already said about um, trilateral research. Um, we do have offices in both Ireland and, and the UK and the company is certainly continuing to grow. Um, uh, of the 70 projects that we've done for the um, European Commission so far, one of them is CC Driver, as Susan was just mentioning. And uh, I coordinate that project, which is, focusing on the human and technical drivers of cybercrime. Um, the project is funded uh, to the tune or has a budget of 5 million euro. Um, it started in May 2020 and finishes in a year's time. We have 13 partners from nine countries in the consortium. Um, so that's an ongoing concern. Um, one of the things that we're looking at in the CC driver project is um, we're doing a socioeconomic impact assessment of cybercrime. Um, and uh, as part of that exercise, we've um, noticed um, and made a point of reporting on uh, the fact that cybercrime costs are going up, as lots of people have noticed. Um, the annual cost of cybercrime to the global economy was estimated at five and a half trillion euro in 2020, according to the European Commission, um, which was double the cost of cybercrime uh, just five years ago or five years previously in 2015. 
um, uh, a U.S. cybersecurity expert um, and also editor of Steve Morgan, um, and also the editor of Cybercrime magazine, um, estimates that cybercrime is growing at about 15% a year, and he estimates that the cost to our economies is going to be around $10.5 by 2025. Um, I should say that um, in our studies on, on the socioeconomic impact of cybercrime, we've um, come across some different estimates of the cost of cybercrime. Um, the five and a half euro, five and a half trillion euro quoted by um, the European Commission um, actually came from uh, this cybercrime magazine who estimated at the time it was five and a half dollars, five and a half million dollars, tr trillion dollars rather, not euro, um, but uh, the commission has adopted uh, those euro. Um, now, there's various reasons why cybercrime is going up so much. Um, one of which is that the attack surface is growing. And an example of that is um, in the instance of in the Internet of Things, where we um, currently have around 21 billion IoT devices worldwide, but those are expected to double by 2025. Um, and uh, we saw at least in um, 2019 that the attacks on IoT devices increased by more than 300%. So, you know, the, the, the attack surface is certainly growing, even in the instance of IoT devices. One wouldn't normally think of um, uh, your refrigerator or your television as an attack instrument, but such is the case. And also, um, FireEye, a cybersecurity company, consultancy company, has said that the dwell time of a cyber attack before detection has been increasing from 106 days to 175 days. So it's taking even longer before victims have noticed that they've been attacked. Um, ransomware is another good example of the uh, growth in uh, cybercrime. Um, it's been described as uh, we, we are um, in a golden era of ransomware, um, where attacks have increased by more than 120% in the course of 2020. And the Joint Research Center of the European Commission has described uh, ransomware as one of the greatest threats that organizations face today, regardless of their sector. Um, and it's also um, noteworthy, and I'll make more of a point of this a bit later on, that more than half of all of cyber attacks are committed against small and medium enterprises. So um, SMEs are bearing the brunt of many cyber attacks these days. Um, and cybercrime pays. The chances of a cyber criminal getting caught are almost zero. Um, the World Economic Forum a couple of years ago said that the prosecution of cyber criminals in the United States is as low as 0.05%. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a crime that can be committed virtually without punishment. Um, uh, the, uh, the JRC has described cybercrime as the greatest transfer of wealth in history. And uh, with the introduction of AI, um, you know, I think it's, it's bad news for many companies, many governments, and many defenders, um, because AI, I think, will empower cyber attackers even more than is the case today. Um, so far, cyber attackers have not been using AI very much, but experts agree that they will, and for various types of attacks, for autonomous social engineering, for example, social media manipulation, deep fakes, cyber weapons, and so forth. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen many instances of deep fakes and they are becoming um, very good, very hard to detect. And they um, present um, a serious threat for 
um, companies where CEOs might be um, imitated and told to um, uh, to tell their finance managers to transfer some number of millions to some other account and preferably in the Seychelles or Cayman Islands or somewhere or where politicians, in fact, Zelensky from the Ukraine was um, recently the subject of a deep fake attack where he, he um, was saying that they should give up. Um, so it's just misinformation tied with uh, artif artificial intelligence. Um, the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, um, which was chaired by Eric Schmidt, the ex-CEO of Google, said in its report to Congress uh, a year ago that AI is deepening the threat posed by cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns that Russia China and other state and non-state actors are using to infiltrate our society, steal our data and interfere in our democracy. The limited uses of AI enabled attacks to date are the tip of the iceberg. So I think if this is a warning coming from uh, the likes of Eric Schmidt, it's something that uh, all of us need to take seriously. So AI uh, will transform the cyber threat landscape in at least three ways that we can see. One is that AI systems are advancing current threats. Uh, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, but self-replicating malware and autonomous disinformation campaigns. That's one way. Second, um, AI systems are generating new threats like deep fakes that we mentioned. Um, AI and AI fuse data for targeting or blackmail. And thirdly, AI systems themselves are under attack, i.e. by attacks like model inversion training, data manipulation, and data lake poisoning. So um, AI is transforming our cyber threat landscape in at least these three ways. A warning from the um, US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. They said, and this is further bad news, they said that malware in the AI era will mutate into thousands of different forms once it's lodged on a computer system. AI makes it harder for anyone to hide his or her financial situation, patterns of daily life, relationships, health, and even emotions. We know this already, it's happening today already. Um, and we also see that personal and commercial vulnerabilities may become national security weaknesses as adversaries map individuals, networks, social fissures, and how best to manipulate behavior and cause harm. Now, we, we can see um, that the use of AI is particularly good in, in, in exactly what I've just said here, mapping individuals. So it becomes a way of blackmailing um, individuals as well, politicians and um, corporate leaders. So, you know, again, something that we need to be aware of and um, try to do something about. The problem is that law enforcement authorities are unable to deal with all of the attacks that we're experiencing these days. The U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission told the U.S. Congress a year ago that government alone cannot defend the nation. And let me just repeat that. The government can't defend the nation alone. It doesn't have the necessary infrastructure in place to protect businesses from many of the cyber attacks that they experience today. And furthermore, the commission, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission said that the government lacks the relationships with the private sector to achieve a unity of effort at the scale required to defend forward. Um, now, I've put those two words, defend forward, in red to highlight those words. Um, defend forward is um, um, a synonym for a concept that I want to talk about now, um, which is active defense. Um, it's a synonym for active defense. Um, active defense is a 
a term and an issue that is being discussed on both sides of the Atlantic and especially I would say since the World Economic Forum uh, conference in 2019 where this was the subject of uh, one of the sessions at the uh, at the uh, forum. Um, I think we can define active defense simply as a set of measures aimed at repelling attacks. So the goal of active defense is to disrupt adversaries, enable network defenders to detect and respond to malicious activities, to send a signal to adversaries, and to establish a level of cyber norms in cyberspace. All pretty noble stuff. Um, however, the grace of uh, the uh, the um, active defense term is a little bit ambiguous, and some people um, have described it as a gray zone. And I think it's a very good um, term to use to describe active defense. Um, it's because active defense measures range from the conservative, e.g. information sharing, to the aggressive, e.g. takedowns. Countering some types of cyber attacks inevitably involves offensive actions, for example, taking down a botnet. Some active defense measures would preempt cyber attackers or even strike back at them. So a range of measures from, as I say, from uh, the relatively conservative to quite aggressive, and all of those are in play. Now, I'm going to um, just give you a few examples of some active defense measures, and um, you can have a think about those and see whether you agree with them. Are those um, active de defense measures legitimate ones that we should uh, um, apply in an era when so many companies, so many organizations and individuals even are being attacked all the time. So I'm just going to go through um, some of these. You can have a think about them. So the first one I would say is relatively innocuous, which is basic cybersecurity. Everyone should have firewalls and antivirus programs. Uh, they should be updating their software regularly. Uh, they should use two-factor authentication, backup stuff to the cloud frequently, and um, also on external drives. And the consequence, hopefully, will be that the defenses are strong enough to uh, deter attackers and criminals from spending more of their time and money to achieve the gains that they hope to achieve from attacking your system. Access control is another active defense measure, which is limiting access to your databases on a need to know basis and also keeping logs, you know, who has access to the database. When did they access it? How long were they um, accessing and so forth? Um, information sharing and reporting is a particular need these days. Um, I've read that uh, it's been um, estimated that something less than 1% of cyber attacks are reported, um, which means that the um, the uh, volume of, of cyber crime is much greater than um, some official or uh, some as estimates have, have given us. Um, but information sharing and reporting is very important um, for helping uh, companies to uh, be conscious of attacks that others have experienced. And it also helps to report attacks to law enforcement authorities and cybersecurity incident response teams, CSERTs, um, about those attacks um, by informing uh, law enforcement authorities and CSERTs about attacks. We have a better chance of understanding them and repelling them. Um, and then naming and shaming is a particular active defense measure, um, but it does have challenges. Um, attribution is particularly challenging and it is embedded with pitfalls because many um, 
instances of malware are disguised. I mean, for example, the Russians um, disguised the NetPetya uh, virus as originating from North Korea. So um, attribution is, is uh, not a simple topic. Um, here's some more. Um, so the victim might initiate a court action against the attackers to undertake a civil lawsuit. That's um, another measure that could be employed. Uh, the snag, of course, at the, is that the attacker might be beyond the court's jurisdiction. Um, if the attacker is based in Russia or China, the, uh, the chances of a successful prosecution are pretty small, but nevertheless, a lawsuit does a draw, draw attention to that attacker or um, that attacker's or organization. Um, attribution alliances are quite um, useful, I think, as well. Um, where a group of uh, victims can collaborate um, to identify an attacker. And also multiple victims are harder for law enforcement authorities, policymakers, and the public to ignore. If there's just me saying I've been attacked, I probably will be ignored. But if there's you know, 20 companies uh, all saying they've been attacked, it will be harder for governments and law enforcement authorities to ignore them. Um, another active defense measure, which is um, being used a lot in the last few years are um, bounties. Even governments have been, <clears throat> even governments have been, and, and big companies like Google and Amazon and Apple and so forth have been, Microsoft have been um, paying hunters bounties for identifying vulnerabilities and especially um, zero day vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, the last set of active defense measures I want to mention are these. Um, another one is uh, signaling. Um, um, and this is where a cybersecurity certificate might help to deter attackers if they see that you've um, uh, taken measures to earn that cybersecurity certificate. Uh, honeypots are a good way of luring attackers um, uh, to uh, luring them and attacking, uh, trapping them. That, that's good. Hacking back is uh, 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 still more aggressive where uh, the uh, victim attacks the attackers um, and disrupt, disrupts the attacker's system and network. Um, asset recovery. Um, great idea, uh, US uh, government and some agencies um, recovered some of the ransom that had been paid to, uh, following the colonial pipelines attack. Um, uh, they didn't recover all of it, but they recovered some of it. Um, and it's great if uh, asset recovery is a real possibility, but in fact, very few instances of asset recovery actually take place. So, you know, yeah, it's a great active defense measure, except not very many agencies are capable of doing it or spending the time uh, doing, but still it sends a signal, sends a message. Um, takedowns and preemptive strikes I mentioned previously, those are very aggressive. Um, uh, and they do pose risks too, like political blowback. Um, and final, the final one that I want to mention is um, trade sanctions. So victims can petition their government to institute trade sanctions against the attacker or the offending um, country of refuge. Very difficult to um, orchestrate that, but still it does happen. So what's the position of the European Commission in regard to active defense? Well, the European Commission released a call for proposals last year, which is very interesting. It's the first time I've ever seen such a call for proposals. And in this particular case, the Commission said they wanted to have proposals that would improve systems response um, and the capacity of a system to respond autonomously to attacks. Um, you have to think about each of these phrases and the implication of each of these phrases. Um, identifying vulnerabilities in other machines 
and deciding which vulnerability to attack and when, and by deceiving the attackers and countering the ways that AI can be used for attacking. So such text to me suggests that the commission recognizes that despite all the good efforts of, uh, of the commission itself and countries, member states, US government and so forth, it can't provide a cyber shield for everyone. And that pure defense is not an effective deterrent. That's what I conclude from that statement. Um, and, and the commission is seriously considering active defense measures. Nevertheless, active defense raises legal, ethical, and policy issues. And I'd like to turn now to some of those points. Um, it's apparent to me and others that there is a clear need for policy and regulatory guidance in this area. Um, we have, I mentioned a couple of the um, EU projects in which trilateral is involved, uh, CC Driver and another one called Cyberspace. And in both of those projects, we, are been, we have been looking at addressing the disparities in cyber policy and legislation in the EU member states. And um, we uh, undertook, in the case of the CC driver project, we undertook a comparative analysis of policy and legislation in eight member states. And we found some quite interesting differences um, between those um, countries. Um, so uh, there are, uh, and I'll just mention these, there are certainly obviously legal constraints on active defense, how far companies can go in defending themselves. Um, they don't have an explicit right to active defense. Um, legal regimes typically prohibit active defense measures that occur outside the victim's own network. And that means that a business cannot legally retrieve its own data from the computer of the thief who took it, at least not without some court ordered authorization. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that we did this comparative assessment of cyber legislation in eight member states, and we found that the definitions and imprisonment links and the monetary fines for the same cybercrime offense varied from country to country. Uh, as an example, the penalties for data interfer interference offenses can range from six months to 14 years, depending on the country. And we also found differences in the coverage of cyber crimes and national legislation. So for example, some, um, um, some countries didn't do anything or say anything about the misuse of devices or computer related forgery. So some, some differences which would suggest there's um, need for more harmonization of cybersecurity policy and legislation, especially in the EU. Um, now, AI-powered active defense raises a number of ethical issues, and I think those ethical issues can be grouped in um, three, around three topics. One is the right of use, who can actually use those active defense measures, um, the legal and normative basis for active defense, and the general ethics of AI. Now, the first two topics apply to active defense more generally, whereas the third topic is specific to AI-powered active defense. There's some other ethical considerations that I'm sure you and any of us can think about in terms of um, active defense, but one is uh, active defense cyber attack responses should serve as deterrents and they should be dissuasive, they should be effective, but they should also be proportionate, they should be legal, they should be ethical. Um, desirably, responses should have the blessing of our governments. Governments should say in what instances we could um, defend ourselves better from attackers. Um, and also, uh, active defense measures should not 
harm innocent third parties. I think that should be obvious and they shouldn't violate the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, here's where it gets a little bit trickier. There are some more ethical considerations that we can contemplate here, um, and especially taking into account some of the things that have been said about artificial intelligence. Um, so AI, many organizations agree, should be protective of human rights and well-being, including the right to privacy. They should be explainable, and they should be accountable to people. However, in active defense, all ethical expectations of AI, I would suggest, are problematic, both in principle and in practice. Cyber criminals arguably lose a portion of their rights when they decide to commit crimes, but AI-powered active defense will inevitably be harmful to some humans on the receiving end. And regarding transparency, something that would um, uh, fall within those first three points that I mentioned in the first um, bullet, regarding transparency, governments have real, no real interest in revealing their offensive AI cyber cap capabilities. They're not interested in transparency, and they're not interested because transparency would render many of those active um, defense, AI-powered active defense measures ineffective. So, um, you know, one can ask the question about various active defense measures. Are they ethically questionable? And um, remember, the active defense measures, the examples that I've given so far, are no by no means comprehensive. There's lots of other active defense measures that are being talked about, but these are some of them. And one can, uh, to address this question, are active defense measures ethically questionable? One can say, well, it depends who's asking the question. Um, it, the answer may depend on um, who answers the question and who is uh, who is a, it's applicable to. So, for example, we can say, yeah, everybody should be engaged in basic cybersecurity. Governments promote it. It's no problem for the um, private sector, and it doesn't really raise any ethical issues as long as it doesn't infringe the rights of those being protected. Now, naming and shaming might be a bit more complicated. Um, in some instances, the government may approve naming and shaming. They've certainly done it in the case of Microsoft or Google. Um, uh, and uh, naming and shaming might be okay as a measure for the private sector, but as I mentioned, attribution is challenging. And so um, um, that, that particular measure should be approached with some, some caution. Um, to take another one, takedowns and preempt, preemptive strikes. Well, governments may approve um, takedowns and preemptive strikes in some instances, and um, private sector organizations may also engage in takedowns and preemptive strikes. But again, it depends on the circumstances, and inevitably, um, it's, it should be regarded as a political decision. Now, another point I think it's necessary to mention at this point is that cyber crime is a cross-border phenomenon. Uh, the com commission uh, reported in 2018 that more than half of all criminal investigations include a cross-border um, dimension, a request to access electronic evidence in other countries. Um, but again, as I mentioned a moment ago, transparency may compromise the secrecy surrounding some countries' own cybersecurity capabilities, so they may be wary of that. Um, the, the Commission has introduced uh, three important pieces of legislation uh, and policy that I'd like to mention now. Uh, one is the Cybersecurity Act of July 2019. 
And the Cybersecurity Act uh, is basically in two parts. One is describing better and expanding the role of uh, ENISA, the European Network and Information Security Agency. And the sort of second half of the Cybersecurity um, Act addresses cybersecurity certification. Definitely, ENISA and the European Commission want to move forward with cybersecurity certification. Why? Well, one in indicates to the user that the product or service can be trusted, or at least that it meets the standards of trust and cybersecurity requirements. Um, it helps to harmonize cybersecurity practices within the union, and it helps users make more informed choices. So there's some good rationales for cybersecurity certification. Um, the second document from the Commission that I want to note is the cybersecurity strategy, which the Commission released on the 16th of December 2020. And they described it as, um, a, a, as a great strengthening of their cybersecurity dipl diplomacy tool box to prevent, discourage, deter, and respond to cyber attacks against the EU. Now, when they say prevent, discourage, deter, and respond, it's noteworthy to me, at least, that they don't use the word defend. So when they talk about prevent, discourage, deter, and respond, it seems to me another indication that they're talking about active defense measures. Um, the cybersecurity strategy also says that we need to have um, uh, a global, open, stable, and secure cyberspace. Nobody would argue with that. And we also need to have regular and structured exchanges with stakeholders, including the private sector, academia, and civil society. Nobody would argue with that either, except that it isn't happening to nearly to the extent to which it should be. Um, on that same day that the Commission released the cybersecurity strategy, it also released its proposal for the NIST 2 directive, the Network and Information Security 2 directive. The, NIST, the first NIST directive in 2016 was the very first um, uh, EU-wide cybersecurity legislation, and it was pretty good, except the shortfalls um, became pretty obvious within a year or two, and the Commission started working on an expansion of the NIST directive. Um, and um, uh, it has some um, interesting and different points, uh, a couple of which I want to draw to your attention here. One is that it obliges um, when it describes as essential and important entities to notify competent authorities within 24 hours that they've been attacked, within 24 hours of their um, recognizing or seeing that they've uh, been attacked and to make a more detailed report within a month of that. Um, it, it, the uh, infrastructure that the NIST 2 directive would put in place, uh, the commission describes as a real cybersecurity shield for the EU. One can um, think about that, that possibility. Um, however, it says little about imposing sanctions on cyber criminals and attackers. The NIST 2 directive um, proposed directive uh, does attempt to overcome the lack of information sharing between member states and companies and EU entities. Um, and it also says that national cybersecurity strategy should include tools to support voluntary cybersecurity information sharing between companies in compliance with law. Um, and information sharing is what the cyberspace project is about, or a good part of the cyberspace project is all about. Um, we, it's focused on regular exchanges between law enforcement authorities and companies. And to that end, we've set up working groups of law enforcement authorities and working groups of law enforcement authorities and companies. And um, we're putting out some questionnaire surveys. Um, however, I would say that while these um, uh, pieces of legislation and projects have been um, useful, they haven't been enough to slow the rise in cybercrime or even to anticipate the next generation of cybercrimes powered by AI. 
And I think exchanges of, of information, while useful, are unlikely to protect companies against the onslaught, onslaught of attacks that they face today. So let's draw a few conclusions. One is that I think companies do not have confidence in governments that can protect them. They can see that um, many of their peers have been attacked and they continue to be attacked and the um, number of attacks is growing up. They're not confident that governments have the sustained determination and resources needed to counter threats and to pursue cyber attackers. Um, another conclusion is that the uh, range of um, active, the range of technological uh, self-defense or active defense measures is rather wide. And I think we can say the same thing about the ethics of uh, AI as well. I'm just going to close this uh, file, I'm sorry. Um, right. Um, and I think the, yeah, the ethics of active defense, I think, also can be described as a gray zone. Um, part of the reason for that is ethical issues brush up against political and legal considerations. Um, and we don't want companies getting in the way of foreign policy. It's not, but it's not sufficient to restrict active defense measures to the so-called essential and important entities. Uh, let's just go on to the next one. Um, uh, information sharing needs to be two ways. Uh, governments and companies need to work together. We've seen that in many um, uh, cybersecurity policies and we see it in draft legislation and we see it in articles, um, but information sharing needs to be a two-way exercise. It's not sufficient simply for companies to say, I've been attacked. Um, law enforcement authorities and cybersecurity incident response teams need to report back to victimized companies what they are doing to pursue the attacker. And if they're not doing anything, at least they should explain to the LEAs why they aren't able to pursue those criminals. And uh, last uh, slide. Governments and private sector entities must collaborate together in active defense. There's a demonstrable need for effective active defense measures. Which measures is the question. Um, EU and national authorities need to agree some guidelines on active, active defense measures so that companies can defend themselves better. They need to partner with small and medium enterprises, as well as essential important entities in developing a framework for active defense. So not just the Googles and Apples and Amazons of the world, but small companies as well. Um, the framework should confirm government or oversight, of course. It should ensure privacy and fundamental rights are not violated, and they should address AI-powered cyber attacks. And finally, last point, this, the framework should indicate which active defense measures should be allowable under which circumstances and by whom. And I thank you for your attention. Any questions? I welcome them. Excellent. So I'm going to take over. We have questions, Claudia and I, but we're also going to take over because we're sure that our students also have questions. So could I first ask if any of our students have questions that they'd like to ask David Wright? You need to put a hand up. Maybe you could stop sharing your screen, um, yes. David, and then we will... Let them hop in. I see that either Amelia Jackson or Sandra has a question. Would you like to unmute and come on in? Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, my name is Jackson. Um, I just want to thank you so much for coming. But I have two questions for you. So the first question, 
uh, my mother's a nurse in the United States and at her hospital, uh, they just have decided instead of investing in cybersecurity, they're just going to pay ransoms because it's easier. It's for them. It's they don't want to invest in all that. What, how, and you said you wanted to work with small and medium enterprises. What type of steps would you take to get, say, like a hospital system that works in healthcare to incorporate cybersecurity into just the daily runnings of things? Great question. Well, um, I, yeah, it is a great question. It's a very good question. Um, uh, it's possible that the uh, ransom demanded is less than the cost of uh, replacing a system, for example. Um, part of the problem with ransomware is that um, even after the victims have paid the ransom, the attackers uh, don't always Act, uh, allow access to the data that they've frozen or the systems or the networks that they've frozen. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's risky paying the ransom because it may not work. Uh, I, I, I vaguely recall seeing some figures um, which suggest a very high proportion, um, you know, half of, this, of the ransomware attacks um, don't result in the victim getting their data back. Um, I think paying attackers is problematic because it just encourages them to attack again. And there are many instances where um, victims have paid the ransom and they get attacked by the same attacker again, even after they've paid the ransom. Many instances of that. Um, so I think that's problematic. Uh, I think a lot of hospitals or other companies should, should, could and should save themselves some grief by making sure that they back up their systems on some um, uh, independent medium. So if their computers get attacked, there's a backup on the cloud, or they've got a backup on a hard drive somewhere. Um, you know, lots of people don't back up their stuff nearly as regularly as they should, but, um, you know, with an attack, um, it sharpens one's um, perspective, I would say. I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. Oh, thank you. It does. And I, I have one more question as well in terms of using... Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm going to capitalize on this moment. Um, uh, so in terms of the use of AI in def in active defense, if my question kind of comes to the idea of, will it just keep mounting? Will the attackers develop a more aggressive AI? And then um, the defenders will do more honeypot traps with the AI honeypot and then become it just like every single year it'll become more and more aggressive on both sides. Is, is that a risk that could take place? I, I'm sure that's absolutely true. Um, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a magazine called Mad Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they ran a, um, a cartoon strip called Spy versus Spy. And I think that's um, very much the situation that, um, you know, some, some cybersecurity experts have described where, you know, we, we are in a kind of uh, you know, strange dialectic where uh, we try to improve our defenses and the attackers try to improve their um, instruments of attack, their malware, and we raise our barrier still higher. Um, um, uh, you, you know, I, I would assume that this kind of um, uh, attack versus counterattack or spy versus spy is going to continue for some length of time in the future. I, I hope that as um, people could become more uh, focused on uh, horrible things like uh, Putin's war in UK, Ukraine or um, COVID-19 or the climate uh, crisis that they will um, focus, uh, spend less time on figuring out how to attack other people and more time on how to save their own skin. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you so much. Do we have other questions? I have a question, but I would like our students to go first. I don't see any other questions. Yes, yes no? I have a question. This is Amelia. Amelia, go. Oh, you're in the same room. Yeah, right yeah, ahead. Yes. 
Uh, you, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, you said in one of your slides that transparency may compromise a country's cybersecurity capabilities. I'm interested in hearing more about that and specifically how you think that issue could be remedied. Yeah, um, well, transparency in AI uh, was a subject of some considerable discussion, I would say, uh, two or three or four years ago. Um, since then, I think the term explainable AI has become uh, more popular and, um, uh, you know, I would say uh, makes more sense too. Um, you know, I mean, you, you could open a black box, but for most people, I would say it would be uh, that that level of transparency would be totally meaningless. Um, explainable AI, I think, is a better term. It, uh, uh, it, it functions more on what is the AI actually doing. Transparency might not achieve that, um, but with explainable AI, the developers are obliged to say what the algorithm is doing, um, who's going to be using, how it's going to be used, what sort of safeguards they put in place, and um, who people should contact if, if they have some um, issue with the algorithm. So, um, uh, I mean, I have nothing against transparency. Don't get me wrong. I just think explainability is a better term. Thank you. We have time for one more question, possibly two. Do I just hop in? Because for some reason, my screen can't see the hands. All right. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead with mine. David, we've had a really interesting two weeks at the French War College. I've brought Professor Rhoda in. Um, we're extremely um, curious with the war in Ukraine, Russia is never going to recover. It will not recover, at least not for a generation. Uh, many political analysts are now predicting that within 10 to 12 years, Russia will just become a series of criminal statelets connected through resource transactions and, and other affinities. What do you think, what sort of a challenge would that pose to have a very large region with a well-educated population that has no other way to earn a living other than through cybercrime? Um, yeah, thanks, Susan. That's also a very good question. Um, I think it's very interesting since the attack started, since uh, Putin's war started, that um, lots of professionals are leaving uh, Russia. So, you know, a lot of their best talent um, disagrees with the war and they're showing their disagreement with their feet. They're leaving the country. So um, I think that's going to hurt the uh, long term future of Russia. They're not going to have um, so many uh, so many talented professionals uh, um, as they did before the war started. Um, I think it's totally possible that uh, the country could degenerate into a series of, of um, uh, cyber crime statements, let's say. Um, to some extent, that has already happened. Um, Putin, however, seems to be um, tolerating uh, the cyber criminal gangs and cyber attackers as long as they don't get in his way. Um, and as long as he can uh, in, uh, instruct them to do his bidding or through some intermediary. Um, uh, I think uh, with the uh, higher levels of uh, response to the attack and the higher levels of, uh, I mean, especially uh, uh, cybersecurity responses to the attacks, it's going to be harder for the Russians to um, freely mount the attacks that they have been doing um, previously. Uh, so I think it's going to be harder for the Russians. I mean, that's my, my expectation is that it's going to be harder for the Russians. Um, and uh, if the economy really does degenerate a lot and cyber criminal gangs and cyber attackers are taking more than what uh, Putin might like, um, uh, he's going to put a stop to that. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, already there's speculation that um, Putin's days in power may be numbered. Uh, the more damage that's done to the Russian economy and to the society, the more difficulty he's going to have to shore up his own support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Exactly. All right. Well, I I, can I, yes, Claudia has a question. One like last she's question. Going to wind up. And then, uh, yes, because I think something maybe that it's important to identify is that in which way cybercrime is different from other type of crime because um, if you like the ethical questions you were asking um, could be asked about That's any type of crime fun. right um, and for and, and we have made some decisions we have a judiciary system and so on and but now we are facing a problem that in there are certain difference between other types Types of crime and cyber crime um, that mean that we cannot directly transfer um, the the means we have been using for such a long time and we have all accepted. And I can see problems such as the fact that or the, the transnational nature of cyber crime, the the, the 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 fact that many attacks do not reveal themselves until it may be too late to actually do anything about it. If you if you think about manipulation, for example, and the effects that we have seen on election and so on. What so where do you see the differences and the the, the similarity and the differences between cybercrime and other types of crimes? Well uh, that's a good question as well, Claudia. Thank you for that. Um, uh, we can distinguish between cyber dependent and cyber enabled crime. So um, cyber dependent uh, crime, an example might be, um, uh, you know, automated uh, uh, letter campaigns or e e email campaigns um, launched by North Koreans or Nigerians or the v Vietnamese to um, uh, get, uh, you know, to trick people. Um, uh, cyber enabled crimes, I would say, are things like deep fakes. Um, you, you, you need AI to create a deep fake. Um, so there's a difference between um, cyber enabled and cyber dependent crimes. Um, I have to say, it, uh, we just published, uh, or a, a couple of partners in the CC Driver um, project just published a few days ago uh, a typology of cybercrime. Um, uh, I'm somewhat familiar with it, especially for the deliverable, but I want to read the whole article. But um, I think that um, that article on a typology of cybercrime uh, might be of interest to you or some of your students, too, if they're interested in cybercrime. Um, but um, I mean, you know, to address the bottom line of your question, I think uh, the cyber capabilities, internet capabilities and computer capabilities allow us to uh, uh, commit new crimes, the cyber enabled crimes, but many of those cyber enabled crimes are the same as uh, mm -hmm. regular crimes, uh, fraud and espionage and uh, the theft of intellectual property. Uh, you know, those are crimes that occur without computers. That's excellent. Um, we're going to have to draw to a close, David, even though we have more questions for you. I think this has been a wonderful, wonderful contribution to the president's series on technology and the human future. And your expertise in this particular domain, as well as in other domains with which we're familiar, is remarkable. And personally, I'd like to thank you for all of the hard work you do to support and bolster the human rights system in Europe. So thank you on behalf of all of us at AUP. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thanks.